Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning. As we continue in our studies, we're going to take a little detour, but we're going to be looking at some things that as we have gone through the book of Zechariah, that Mrs. White has stated that we need to consider where we need to pay attention. We're going to be considering her words as we go further and prepare to study the next several chapters of Zechariah. So as we prepare for this, as we open the word of God, shall we ask for his guidance? Thank him for his many blessings that he is providing and look to him for the wisdom that we need for this time in our history. Shall we now pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on these Sabbath days, thanking you for the many blessings that you provided us through this week. We thank you for these Sabbath hours where we may set aside the work that we have done and consider that which you would have us to understand. Direct us now, please. Guide us in all things. Help us so that what we do, what we say, what we learn, may bring us into a closer relationship with you so that your character may be seen in place of ours. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us now so that we may draw closer together and come to understand what you would have us to do so that your words may fall upon the ears that most need to hear them. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to study freely and ask now that you join with us. May your angels surround us. May your spirit open our minds to receive the golden oil that you would have us to receive at this time. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, over the last several weeks, we have been covering Zechariah chapter 5. But as we got into Zechariah 5, we found that Mrs. White was telling us that we needed, as we are examining Zechariah, to also consider carefully Ezekiel 9, Ezekiel 2, and Revelation 5. What is important for us to understand in this portion of the book of Ezekiel? As we're aware, Ezekiel 8 precedes Ezekiel 9. What is important about Ezekiel 8? What did Ezekiel see in this portion of his second vision? Well, he saw a progressive destruction of four. Could we say that he was seeing the four generations? Well, yeah. The progressive destruction of four is the four generations. It's the four seven times. Um, Now, um, I mean, obviously, he's looking at things initially in his time in a progression, but it also applies to other times. So here we are in Ezekiel 9, and we have studied through the book of Ezekiel 9 before. But in this, we're going to need to consider in a very solemn manner what what Sister White had had to say in reference to this chapter and consider it in relation to what we've been looking at in the book of Ezekiel, or excuse me, in Zechariah. Zechariah 4 tells us about the two trees that stand before God in the whole earth. These two trees have golden pipes that come from them, and those golden pipes come into golden bowls. What are the golden bowls of Zechariah 4 that are so important that they must interrelate with Ezekiel 9. Are these golden bowls to be those that are purified to give the final message? All right. Testimony 23, page 21. The prejudice which has risen against us because we have reproved wrongs that God has shown me existed, and the cry that has been raised of harshness and severity is unjust. God bids us speak, and we will not be silent. Was Elder Jeff ever denounced 
for being harsh or severe? Well, yes. Have we been denounced in a similar manner where it has come to these situations when we are trying to ask questions of others? Well, yeah. And and in both cases, like I, I actually never saw it as harsh or severe. He was very straightforward, but often the people criticizing him were the ones really with the problem, not him. Right. If wrongs are apparent among his people, and if the servants of God pass on indifferent to them, they virtually sustain and justify the sinner and are guilty alike with the sinner and will receive the displeasure of God just as surely as the sinner, for they will be made responsible for the sins of the guilty. Is this something that we wish to have said of us? Do we want to be responsible for the sins of others? No. Thank you. Now, at the end of the heavenly day of atonement, who is it that will be responsible for the sins of others? Well, the dumb dogs that will not bark. I was going to say Satan. Thank you. Now, why would we say Satan? Well, Satan bears the responsibility as being the instigator of sin. But it is also true that all those that um, reject Christ's mercy will bear their own responsibility for their sins and the sins that they caused others to commit. Agreed. But who are they acting like then if they're bearing others' sins? Are they not acting as a type of the scapegoat? Yeah, so that so and and this is an interesting argument for the significance of the scapegoat as being Satan. Because we are told in the Bible that we we do bear the responsibility for the sins that um others commit that because we didn't um correct them. Right? And you know, and some people say, well, only Christ can be the sin bearer. Well, he can be the sin bearer for um, forgiveness, right? So Christ bears our sins and, and forgives us. But if if we don't experience that, we will bear our own sins. And and also the sins we cause others to commit. And the scapegoat, is, in a sense, is in that boat in a big way. So what we're looking at here in Ezekiel, <clears throat> as we have been looking at this in Zechariah, is either we are going to stand and bear witness to the work that Christ has done in our lives, or we are going to bear sins of our own and of those that we have caused to sin. So we will stand and bear witness that we are just like the great adversary. Mrs. White continues. I have been in vision pointed to many instances where the displeasure of God has been incurred by a neglect on the part of his servants to deal with the wrongs and the sins existing in their midst. Those men who have excused wrongs have been thought by the people to be very amiable and of a lovely disposition simply because they shunned to discharge a plain and scriptural duty. The task was not agreeable to their feelings. Therefore, they avoided it. Are we to deal and act according to feelings, or are we to deal and act according to fact? According to fact. Thank you. The principles of God, Amos. Thank you again. Are not the principles of God a fact for us to be able to rely on? Amen. Brothers and sisters, are we to proceed according to rumor and innuendo? Are we to base our life with Christ upon gossip and backbiting? Is that how the first disciples were when they met in the upper room after Christ's ascension? Mrs. White continues here. The spirit of hatred which has existed with some because the wrongs among God's people have been reproved has brought blindness and a fearful deception upon their own souls, making it impossible for them to discriminate between right and wrong. They have put out their own spiritual eyesight. 
They may witness wrongs, but they do not feel as did Joshua and humble their souls in humiliation because the danger of souls is felt by them. Do you remember our study of Joshua? Here is Joshua. Does he stand up and tell the people of the children of Israel, oh, it's okay, God will forgive you of this. You you, you have nothing to worry about because of your backbiting. Didn't Joshua fall on his face, humiliating himself because he was concerned about the condition of these people? What was he doing regarding the condition of the children of Israel? The true people of God who have had the spirit of the work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of the faithful and plain dealing with sins, which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000, who are to stand without fault before the throne of God. They will feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Are we to have a spirit that tells others that their rumors, that their gossip, that their strange ideas are all okay? Or are we to be the ones that recognize sin in its true character and sigh and cry for these abominations? On whose side are we to be found? Who was standing? In the counsel of God at this time. Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who would reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed. These, unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and holding up the hands of sinners in Zion will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of all the wicked, represented by the five men bearing slaughter weapons. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth, wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such that they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in an agony, even sighing and crying. Read Ezekiel chapter 9. Is this the work that God desires the church to be doing? Or is this the work that God recognizes must be done? Is this not a strange work for God? What's that work going to look like? I'd have to ask or I'd have to say in my my experience, I've been around a few, excuse me, around a few ministries and some of those ministries were uh, apparently they, they they thought it was their ministry to correct and uh, be the uh, prophet pointing out the sins of the church and the people so how how is that sign and crying carried out is it pointing fingers or is it something different well brother um When it came to the time after Christ had ascended, you have this group of disciples that 40 days before the ascension, 
were left in disarray because their leader had been crucified, right? Now they've had 40 days again with him, and now he is taken from them. What did those disciples do in the meeting that they had amongst themselves for that period before the Feast of Weeks? What are they what what have we been told that they did in the upper room? Well, the upper room experience is to search our own hearts and correct our characters, search for our own defects of characters, pretty much, and and be be uh brothers and sisters about it when you know, helping someone else see something they may not in themselves. Um, okay. In gentleness and weakness. Gentleness and meekness, not drive the sheep further from the flock. What were they doing in that upper room? I would, I'm not sure where you're driving at. There's a lot of answers to that. They were searching their hearts. They were repenting, praying for the fall of the Holy Spirit. Confessing their sins. Confessing their yeah. sins, but to whom? To those that they offended. Right. Confessing their sins to one another, weren't they? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, one another, like Theodore made a good point there, to those that they had sinned, yeah, wasn't willy-nilly going to everybody and telling everybody your sins. Yeah. So if I offended you, I would sin against you. I would come to you. All right. <clears throat> weren't they public also, sins or public contracts. Weren't they also praying? Mm-hmm. So in this in this type of a situation, the confession of the sins the prayer together, the meeting together, did that not bring them into unity? Yep. So we have choices. We have not yet had the upper room experience, brothers and sisters. We have a lot that we're having to look at. We're having to consider from the book of Acts, from the book of Ezekiel, from the book of Zechariah. We keep saying that we want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit going to go to those that are not consecrated in the heart? Yeah. Well, one of the things about the sign and the crying that, that, you know, we just draw our attention to here is that there are many people who believe that their job is to reprove others, that that's the sign and the crying of the sins of others. But they haven't done it with their own sins first. Right. So, I mean, one is it's going to fall upon deaf ears because it's pretty evident that the person that's sighing and crying is messed up. So for those that are, you know, seeking to follow God, um, it's not going to have much effect upon them. And often it's done in a way, of course, that, uh, isn't isn't really going to ever bring anybody uh, to repentance because it's just a condemnatory message that there's no redemptive quality in it. That is, they don't they're not showing love towards that person. They're showing actually quite the opposite. Um, so once our hearts are broken, uh, we we have an opportunity to then reprove others in in love. But it's still, we're not placating sin. The other thing is that often um, the reason why people don't sigh and cry over other sins is because they don't want to actually address the sins in their own lives, right? So so you have, have different reasons why different people act in different ways. But uh, if a person is going to, want to change their life they will be repentant they will see the need to to minister to others and that others would benefit from what they have benefited from right and they're going to treat others in the way that god has treated them not in some you know sort of malicious way the uh thought that comes to mind is that uh what is it the greatest rebuke that God can give to the world is is a witness of his life lived out in ours, like a godly life is the greatest witness and rebuke to this generation. 
So I'm thinking more than words, but to have his character lived out in us will be the rebuke that's being spoken of here more than anything, I think. Yeah, and, and the way that God has changed us. I mean, so one is people will have seen how we were in the past and they'll see this change in our life. And, and that's extremely powerful. But it doesn't mean that everybody's going to uh, respond to that. And, and even the trials that we go through and how we bear those trials, especially, are things that people look upon Wait. and can draw them uh, Wait. Christ. Wait. Wait. I'm mm-hmm. going to interrupt you. No, you say not everybody will respond, but really, not everyone will respond positively. But I do believe people will respond, will be hated. People, God's God's character is convicting. You can either love it or hate it. Yes. One reaction or the other. Yeah. Long, so I get, you on, get you on that technicality as you know your father would. Yeah, but, um, uh, you know, so one of the things, though, uh, you know, when people rebuke others, when they get a negative response, they sometimes take it as a sign that, you know, the other person is the problem not recognizing that they're the problem. So, you know, we don't focus upon the negative Good, response yeah. as a sign that we're we're presenting the truth. Good point. Yeah. Exactly. I was just saying. Mm-hmm. Well, they will react. Yeah, oh, yeah. But you're right. Though. That's a good point to, to remember, hey? Just because someone's upset with us doesn't mean we're right. No. But the general slaughter of all those who do not thus see the wide contrast between sin and righteousness and who do not feel as those who stand in the counsel of God and receive the mark is described in the order of the five men with slaughter weapons. Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare. Neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Peter gives good reference to this to begin with in the New Testament, reminding us that judgment begins first at the house of God. I would address the pupils of the school. Do not wait for a high wrought state of feeling, but calmly view the whole ground and candidly consider whether you will be sons and daughters of God. Decide now without delay. And in doing this, you will have manifest evidence of the companionship and protection of all the heavenly agencies. Angels of God are ascending and descending the mystic ladder, and God is above the light of his glory shining down its entire length, comforting, encouraging all who are climbing faithfully by painful yet cheerful steps. No one will fail who will perseveringly climb this ladder. What does that promise say to you today? That no one, not one, will fail who will perseveringly climb the ladder. May the Lord guide you all, teachers and pupils and church members, to make diligent work for eternity. The end of all things is at hand. There is need now of men armed and equipped to battle for God. Please read Ezekiel 9. Who bear the sign, the mark of God in their foreheads, the men that sigh and cry for the abominations done in the midst of Jerusalem, among those that profess to be God's people? not those who are engrossed in games for their selfish amusement. After the mark had been set upon this class, who are registered in the books of heaven as overcomers, by the angelic messenger of God, the command is given to the ministers of destruction. Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. And they began at the ancient men which were before the house. This is Ezekiel 9, verses 5 and 6. 
God grant these solemn predictions, which are so speedily to be fulfilled, may be impressed upon the hearts of all. See Revelation 7, 1 to 4, and Revelation 7, 12 to 17. Zechariah 3. Mrs. White is very, very specific in what we are to compare in line upon line. Are we to adjudge this based upon the time in which Ezekiel lived? Are we to take some of these other strange ways of looking at how the Bible is to be understood? Is she not showing us here very directly that we are to understand the scripture, comparing scripture with scripture? Letter 49, 1893. Now, how about how long was this after the meeting in Minneapolis? Well, five years. So. Right. No, the exact date. Right. We're not looking at the exact date. Oh, yeah. We're saying about five years right now. We have a special burden of testimony to bear for the youth and for the entire church in regard to the manner in which they spend their holidays and the youth and the use they make of their money and of their time. And then there comes over from America, a journal from Battle Creek filled with a description of the games played on the school grounds, as if it was essential, and that this particular knowledge should be transported to this country. And then when we have so few facilities furnished us, so little help in workers and a means, I am in great perplexity. I expected to hear that great work was done after the descent of the Holy Spirit. There would be a going forth filled with zeal and love and deep devotion by the students to do real, good, thorough, well-organized efforts under instructors, teaching them how to work to be a blessing to others. There are ways that the time of the students can be employed their young zeal and youthful ardor can be used to glorify God. Thus was it in the school of the prophets. All their powers were trained and consecrated to service. Here is education that we shall need in the day of trial coming upon us as a thief in the night, stealing unawares. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 9. Second Peter 3, 10 to 14. Revelation 3, 2 to 4. Ephesians 6, 9, or excuse me, 6, 10 to 18. Philippians 2, 12 to 16. Titus 2, 6 to 8 and 11 through 15. I write you referring to these scriptures. I have not time to write them out in full. This coming week, I challenge you all to read through these passages. Even if you only read one of these passages per day but compare them what do they say to you as we continue in this portion of study i want to say i have seen satan triumphing over the entering into his devices in games plans which he will use to decoy souls to their everlasting ruin jesus also i saw looking with sadness upon his heritage saying where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? Jeremiah thirteen twenty. Let us heed the words of warning given us. The great day of the Lord is upon us. Upon us it cometh, cruel both with the wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinner thereof out of it. Isaiah thirteen nine. Ezekiel nine. She just makes a statement. Ezekiel 9. Let us consider these chapters. Zechariah 3. These are the things that are soon to be transacted, and every soul needs to be preparing for these events. When she says that every soul is to be preparing, does she say that only those that have accepted the word of God are to be preparing? No, every. Agreed. 
I feel so ashamed that at the very heart of the work shall be the very things transacted that in influence lead to the forgetting of God rather than to the remembrance of God. The example is carried to other countries, and we must meet and combat the influence and our work made very much harder. Continuing, letter 31A, 1894. So long have you trifled with and resisted the Holy Spirit of God, as did Pharaoh, that your peril is far greater than was his. Do we want it said of us that we have resisted the Holy Spirit of God? No, 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 no. Do we wish to be compared less favorably than the Pharaoh that ruled Egypt at the time? that Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? Men of like like mind have sustained you, and those who know your danger yet have not set the danger before you have an account to render to God for keeping you in positions of trust. When if you had the power, you would hurt and destroy the messengers and the message that God has sent. You would rejoice to discover in them errors that you could make use of to depreciate all their work. The Lord reads the heart as an open book. The men who are not connected with God have done many things after the imagination of their own evil hearts. The Lord declares concerning them, they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. Jeremiah 32, 33. We are amid the perils of the last days. The time will come when the prophecy of Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled. That prophecy should be carefully studied, for it will be fulfilled to the very letter. How many times have we considered Ezekiel 8 and Ezekiel 9 as being a prophecy? As of 1894, Sister White refers to this as a prophecy that will be fulfilled to the very letter. In what tense in English is she speaking? Oh, she's talking about the future to her time. Okay. Now, if she's speaking of the future to her time, have we seen the prophecy of Ezekiel 9 being fulfilled since her passing? No. So what does that mean for us today? Oh, it's still future. So Ezekiel 9 has yet to be fulfilled, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Study also the 10th chapter, which represents the hand of God as at work to bring perfect method and harmonious working into all the operations of his prepared instrumentalities. The 11th and 12th chapters should also receive critical, thoughtful attention. Let these prophecies be studied on your knees before God, unless you take up the stumbling blocks, which by your own perverse spirit, you have laid in the way of many who have been connected with you. God will turn his face utterly from you and your associates. True religion is the imitation of Christ. So I'm going to ask this question specifically. Brother Kelly, does this statement make sense in the manner in which you had been recently addressing and asking questions about this study? Another question another question occurred to me when you were reading that, and I forget what it was now. Uh, just the last part. What was that? The last few sentences. Could you refresh my memory? Oh, there they are on the screen, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. My question was going to be, uh, was she writing this to a person? <clears throat> or was this something? Oh, this is a letter to a person. And what person is it? being written to again yeah well look just a moment okay 
Okay, so letter 31A, 1894. This was written on the 27th of October to A.R. Henry at the Review and Herald, Battle Creek, Michigan. So <clears throat> perhaps one of the editors or an article writer for the Review and Herald. Anyway, so that's interesting. Someone from the Review and Herald was being drawn up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wondered if it was someone like Butler or whatever, but no. Okay. So there must have been studies being presented in the Review and Herald or something on this, and she was trying to no. correct it? Um, what, what I'm reading here quickly, the first couple of paragraphs are interesting. The beginning of the second paragraph says, it was the duty of the president of the general conference when he was convinced that a wrong estimate was placed upon men to stand firmly against such a course of action. But he has not always done this because he was afraid of you and of Captain Eldridge. It is because these things stand recorded against you in the books of heaven that I write you this morning. When Elder Olson's okay. voice should have been heard in remonstrance and rebuke, that voice was not heard. He did not have faith in God to lay his hand firmly upon that which, under the control of the Spirit of God, he knew to be wrong. And without hindrance, you have pursued your own course, venturing to do things in your own spirit, walking in the fire of the sparks of your own kindling. Now, if we're walking in the, in the fire from the sparks of our own kindling, who are we acting mm -hmm. like? Uh, ourselves okay but what example from scripture is she giving reference to i don't know i forget that one <clears throat> i've studied this before do is tell it, I, I forget it, the connection is it not nadab and, and Abihu? what it meant nadab and Abihu. oh yeah okay now what did they do that was so bad strange fire alcohol intoxication presumption and where were they doing mm. this? In the sanctuary. Yes. In the holy place. So in this in this type of situation, God's holy fire is to be respected. We are not to be bringing strange theories into the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a sanctuary of believers or the sanctuary of our mind and heart. Correct. For are we, are we not the very building blocks of the temple of God? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Our lives certainly are. Now, going right back to what, what you were asking at the very outset of the meeting, here we have this statement. True religion is the imitation of Christ. Here we are to reflect Christ, right? Yeah, are you... <clears throat> Dwight, are you basically driving at the character of Christ being reproduced in his people? Yes. By focusing on Christ, that's the that's what she's saying there? Correct. Yeah, yeah, I see it. So in this type of a situation, is Christ not the greater light and are we not to become the lesser light, the reflecting light? Sorry, but, but the answer to that is always. Always. Okay. Those who follow Christ will deny self, take up the cross, and walk in his footsteps. Following Christ means obedience to all of his commandments. No soldier can be said to follow his commander unless he obeys orders. Christ is our model. To copy Jesus full of love and tenderness and compassion will require that we draw near to him daily. Oh, how God has been dishonored by his professed representatives. The first three chapters of Hebrews are presented to me as of great importance to enlighten the eyes and to direct the life. Is Mrs. White here being critical of A.R. Henry, or is she instructing him that he needs more of Christ and less of self. I find Mrs. White's writings to always be redemptive 
um, depending on the lens that we read them through, that's why some people just don't like spirit of prophecy because they got the wrong glasses on. So amen to that, brother. Knowing, amen. So knowing knowing the love that, like, you got to read about her life a little bit too. Get her get to know her as a person. Like she loved, and anything that she wrote was always redemptive, warning, or something. It wasn't just tearing people down. I guess yeah. So, long answer to your question. But a very good answer to the question. Are we to become critical of others and tear other people down? Are we to be casting others out when we're not agreeing with the points that they're making? No, we are not. Well, especially when it's just a a disagreement of a view of Scripture. Right. Right, because often... I mean, we we condemn people because they just don't accept some theory we have. Especially. And and then we, in order to, because they may bring up some valid points, in order to, um, because we can't answer those points, we then just attack the man, right? So uh, we attack the person's character, um, misrepresent the things the person is saying, uh, you know, things like that, where, you know, a true rebuke yeah. is actually... Well, I, I got to stop you there with that. Yeah, but it's, you there it's sin, yeah. but it's rebuking a sin, not, not correcting somebody's theological position that is what's what's being talked about, or interpretation of a scripture. I, I've seen that happen in real life, if you have, where... where uh, People are emotionally vested, vested in their their beliefs, and to change that, you got to get around the emotion part. Not always easy, but people will defend things even if they think they're un, untrue, just because they they don't know where to go emotionally with it. They would have to leave behind many things to adopt the beliefs of God. It's like all of our life. To really follow God, so there, there's where the uh, story you were saying is it bounced off of something I was thinking about. It'll come to me later. Mm. Thanks, man. Well, the one thing that um, that we need to be aware of, of course, is our own emotions and why we react to people the way that we do. So if 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 I'm feeling emotional. Uh, I mean, I need to step back and try to figure out why am I feeling emotional? Um, now, when it comes to other people, I mean, it, it's very difficult at times. If somebody's emotional, they have some kind of stance or position and they feel that you're a threat. I mean, the one thing you don't want to do is attack them on that point. I mean, that's what you want to avoid. If somebody has all their defenses uh, set up in a certain place, well, you have to figure how do I reach this person? How do I avoid all of those defenses? Obviously, that place where they have the defenses uh, is not the best place to approach them. So, you know, there are people who know, who are skilled, that God has given them the gift to deal with people that um, are difficult to deal with. But sometimes there's nothing you can do. Um because they, they may just be resistant to you as a person. And, and so any approach that, that you have will be looked upon with suspicion. So and, and so we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't treat other people that way. You know, just because somebody is, has hurt us in the past doesn't mean that I'm not going to listen to them. Or if I have problems even with certain aspects of their character, doesn't mean that I'm going to ignore everything they say. Because they may have a good point. Yeah, a good a good point on a 12 12- 60 dp or whatever it is dots per inch they may have a good point but out of 1260 points on that screen it's only well, one I, point but i've learned a lot from people that i disagree with on, on many areas and people that i'm not even particularly um, a fan of their personality or character but i still learn many things from them um well and, and at times those are lessons that that are hard to learn because of it. 
that Satan will sometimes allow a person who we maybe don't like to have some point of truth that we need to hear. So or God allows it. Is that what you said? I said, well, Satan will give people even who are evil, you know, that he's working on their minds. He, he will use some point of truth that he doesn't want other people to look at. And so nobody will look at it because the person who who's presenting it all the time is obviously not a balanced individual. But if you take time and look at how it, do you might, know that? how do I know? How do you know? How do you, yeah. How do you know he does that? How? Because Back I've seen it happen yeah. many, many times. I've just experienced it. Well, tell me, that, tell me about it. Like, how does how does Satan do that? It's like a it's like a sleight of hand, switch of play. Well, he, mix, he mixes uh, truth with error. So there's two reasons. One is to make error, yeah, yeah. error. It makes error attractive, right? Because there's some point of truth. So even pe- people who you know have some outlandish ideas, they're going to have some truth there. Right. So nobody will look at, at that, what they're talking about. So, so it does two things. It, it makes error more attractive, but it also, um, muddies the water for some idea that maybe we should look at. Obviously, the conclusions this person came to and how they apply it is wrong, but it might be something that we actually need to examine. And because it's attached to a person well, and a good example of this was actually the doctrine of the state of the dead. The people who were teaching the doctrine of the state of the dead throughout history were usually very fanatical people. And and that that put a bias against it. You can even see just with Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe similar to we do about what happened to the guy. And that's hold on, hold on, hold on. what hold on. Are you saying before eighteen forty four the groups that taught the state of the dead correctly were fanatical as well then or, or is that yeah. post eighteen forty four? No, was always. Yeah. It was, it, the, that. the true view of the state of the dead generally was taken up by fanatical groups. Yeah. Uh, do you know I, I read, I read a book on the history of it. There's a book called uh, The Fire That Consumes by uh, a yeah, fudge. I know it. Right? So yeah. he shows this history of all the different groups that were trying to promote uh you know, right. annihilationism and, and why there was such prejudice against that doctrine because of the manner in which it was presented, but also all of the other errors that were attached to it. All right. Now, brothers, we've come to the, the close of our time together today. Or do we have any other questions or comments at this point? Yeah, I'd like to uh, give thanks to the Lord <clears throat> for using the very backslidden and uh, you cannot reprove these these people. So the only thing I can do is just pray that the Lord restrains, calms me, keeps me calm because they're they are just walking in such darkness. It's incredible. And uh, I'm learning patience and endurance and ruling my own spirit because they. They will not rule theirs. God is actually restraining them. Like I pray for that, right? because they're in Satan's clutches and don't even know it or refuse to acknowledge that. So if you could pray for them that if their probation has not closed, that somehow God will be able to get through that satanic bondage and uh, keep me in health because it's, it's like been very see. difficult. I hope so. Um, sister, I'd like to say that as long as there's breath, there's hope and probation closed. I, I, the picture I have of myself, if my probation ever closed, I'd be pretty crazy. <laughs> um, they, well, there's one of them that so is. Maybe not. Crazy. Maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't even have any idea. Who knows? But, uh, other than that, I'd say, uh, keep walking on the sunny side, you know. And yeah, I know. And I find that, that Christ, I find. I find that sunny side in Christ. Just don't be a, don't just don't be what do they call it, a poly, Pollyanna. Okay, poly, just don't be a Pollyanna, son. Right. Sorry, guys. Okay, so okay. shall we now close, yeah. close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, you have heard our conversation. You've led us in this discussion. We ask, Father, now. 
for your guidance and direction so that we may walk in the path that you would set before us. Help us not to have a critical spirit. Help us not to speak rumors. Help us not to be backbiting. Direct us now in all things. Show us, Father, that that you would have us to understand. May we walk softly before you now, looking and understanding to be blessed as our sins are forgiven and as we come to do that that you would set before us. For this end, we thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.